about that, it's important for us to understand where intelligence comes from. Binet thought it had to do with their exposure, but we also find that intelligence is pretty stable. Is it genetics? Is it culture? Well, the answer, of course, is a bit of both. First, we have to talk about how culture can really impact IQ scores. It's important for us to understand that when intelligence testing first started, it started primarily by American and Western European men of white European heritage who were from pretty well-educated families. And the types of questions they asked were questions that kids from pretty well-educated families could answer. So because of this, the questions tended to be pretty culturally biased, and we weren't really tapping into all different types of knowledge. Of course, intelligence just started 100 years ago. Imagine if we tested people 100 years ago how to use a tablet or a computer or how to connect to Wi-Fi. They might not be able to do that very well. Imagine if you were to take an intelligence test solely based on whether or not you could train an alpaca. How would you do on training an alpaca? Imagine you took an intelligence test based on, by looking at soil, if you could determine if this was going to be a flood year or a drought year. Could you do it? Well, other people in the world can, but that may be something you personally struggle with. And that's because there's lots of different cultural knowledge that can vary between different historical time periods and different places we live in the world and different types of subcultures we live in, even within our cities. For instance, on a former Canadian IQ test given to grade five students, a very common question that appeared was the question, who was Charles Tupper? Do you know the answer to this question? Would you be able to answer this grade five Canadian question? If not, it's probably because you didn't know Charles Tupper was one of our prime ministers and a former premier of Nova Scotia. That's totally okay. Most of us don't know that. But if that was still on the IQ test today, it might lead to us underestimating your intelligence. So we have to make sure we have the right questions. It's also important intelligence tests test the right skills. Some cultures and some historical periods put more emphasis on some types of skills, like training alpacas or using tablets and touchscreen. And we have to recognize the role of exposure. If there's training, if there's mentoring, getting used to the idea of actually taking a test, or whether it's pen and paper or verbal, that can really matter. And we know that Canada has messed this up in the past. We know one of the big dark spots in Canadian history is when we went through a heavy eugenics period from the 1920s to the 1970s, especially in the province of Alberta. According to the Alberta Sexual Sterilization Act, children who scored low on an intelligence test had their reproductive rights taken away from them. And we believe that close to 5,000 people between the 1920s and the 1970s were forcibly sterilized by the government. This is a problem. It's unethical. In addition, the tests they used to do this was problematic. The test was written by people who lived in cities, who lived in urban Canada, and it usually underestimated the scores of kids who grew up on farms in the prairies, kids who had Ukrainian or Catholic heritage, or kids that had First Nations or Métis heritage. So it underestimated what they knew because only tapping into one type of cultural knowledge. So because of this, we're striving now to do better with this and intelligence tests, and we try for culture fair or culture free IQ tests. A culture fair test is the idea that we are only testing things that all cultures have equal access to. This was an ideal start in the 1980s, and it sounds really great, but it's really hard to do. How many things are equally known across cultures? You might say, well, we could test what direction the sun rises in. The sun rises in the east, regardless of what culture you live in. That's true. But even asking about water freezing, maybe you live in an area where water doesn't get cold enough to freeze in the winter, or maybe you have different seasons. If you ask about why something happens, you have to also accept there could be mythology or cultural understanding or folklore that could impede people's understanding of it. So culture fair tests start off with really great ambitions and from a really wholesome spot, but they're really impossible to achieve. Something that's been a little bit more successful is the notion of a culture free test. A culture-free test doesn't try and test things equally exposed to across cultures, but rather tries to just tap into our fluid intelligence and tries to expose us to things no culture has been exposed to. This started in the later 1980s and the early 1990s, and this started off with a lot of matrix testing. And we can see here in the larger blue circle is a bit of a pattern and we have to figure out how to complete the pattern. When this started off, this was not something we commonly learned about in school. Unfortunately now, matrix learning is a type of thing you can learn pamphlets on and you can get training seminars for. So now some societies who are more privileged have better access to this. 
So because of this, whenever we revise IQ tests, we have to come up with new types of problems that have not been trained into certain subcultures. So it is a bit of a difficult thing to stay at the head of. So culture does matter, but does that mean genetics doesn't? Well, genetics do matter too. We absolutely know. By looking at kids of adoption or kids of separated families, we know that genetics accounts for about 50% of our intelligence and really sets in place a range of reaction. That is, your genes can really set up your potential, but whether you reach that potential or not can really determine if you got the right training, the right exposure, if you have some test skills, if your learning disabilities are accommodated on the test, and if the test is culturally unbiased or culturally free. So what happens here is you can increase one's intelligence score, and there is a bit of a training effect. If somebody gets tested in grade five and they don't do so well, but it turns out they had an undiagnosed learning disability, we can increase their test score the next year by accommodating that learning disability. If they also are just completely unfamiliar with the test format, but kind of teaching them what to expect and how testing works, we can see that to, to increase. And finally, if there were problems with the test, because the test tested things like about notes on a saxophone and they don't know anything about a saxophone, then we can erase some of those things and provide a much more fair and balanced test and we might be able to tap into their full potential. So genetics and culture can play a role. The way I want you to think about it is this, like perhaps a cherry tree or a pomegranate tree, if the pomegranate tree has not so great genetic heritage and is planted in not so great soil, it might still grow and grow some fruit, but it's going to be a smaller tree that's not the most luscious flourishing tree ever. If it has one of the two going for it, either stronger genetics or weak genetics but in stronger soil, we can find a pretty mediocre tree. It's, it's going to be okay. But if you have the pomegranate tree that has the strong genetics, and has the enriched soil, you're going to see that tree flourish. And this is the point. Any child who's given the right soil can be brought up to the best we can bring them up to. We can't have influence over someone's genetics, but we can have influence on the soil they're brought into. So we can make a difference through exposure and through support. So now we have finally reached the end of Unit 8. And with that, we've reached the end of the first semester of Intro Psychology. Well done.